Don't mind me. I'm just rocking my handheld palm top. This is the Sharp Zarus SLC 860. Positively Apollo 11's guidance computer in terms of uh, computing age, but nope, nope. This video is about the uh, FX Tech Pro 1 or the QX1000. I don't know, the box says Pro 1, but the phone says QX1000. Turns out I've already been using it a week, but I've carefully repacked it so we could see an unboxing. So in the box with mine, because I pre-ordered, I guess, I don't know if this is a standard feature or not, because the pre-order was weird. Like they said that you would get a case and that you didn't get a case. And then I ordered this about, um, I don't know, like July of 2019, August. No, it was, I don't know. It was a long time ago, a long, long time ago. And then it was supposed to ship and it didn't ship. And then it continued not to ship. And then I complained and then I tried to cancel my order and they were like, well, it's shipping. And then coronavirus <laughs> and then it shipped. <sighs> In the box, got a handy little cloth pouch. It's literally just a cloth pouch. Actually, probably useless for me. Then we have the phone, the phone itself. I'll get to that. Then we have a handy dandy power brick that's modular. So I'm gonna just pop this international stuff off of this and connect it. Now I'm gonna save these connections because I think this is going to be super handy when I go to Computex, like the world plug connection uh, for reasons. I mean, there's the, they have every kind of outlet at the hotel I stay at at Computex, but nice. This is the Qualcomm Quick Charge 3.0. It's not wireless charge or anything like that. It's the, you know, the green connection. It's got the FX Tech logo on it. This is Quick Charge 3.0, and it does actually charge really quickly. I also, you know, like I say, I've been using this phone for a little over a week give or take. And I've tried to charge it with a Apple Mac charger and it quick charges with that and other quick chargers and the quick charge 3.0 compatible and it works. Also tried doing the wireless charging and that did, that did not work for me. Also in this box is a USB-C cable and some instructions and that sort of thing. Now in terms of specs for this phone, like the big draw here is the keyboard. That's why we're talking about the Sharp Zaris SLC 8. 60 and the even more fabulously ancient HP 100LX. This is a 100LX. There's also the 200LX, which is a little more popular. HP sort of hit things in stride. But having a keyboard on an Android device, a true mechanical keyboard, look at that. Now, I've tested this with T Mobile, Verizon, and ATT. I've got a T Mobile SIM in there right now. I haven't had any trouble in terms of bands. It does have the bands that it supports listed on the box. So if you're thinking about, you know, it will it work where you are? Check the bands and it probably will. This is a dual SIM phone, so that works pretty well. The SIM slot is right here on the the uh, sort of the, the buttonless edge, the edge of the phone that doesn't have any buttons. It has a tray that will hold a SIM card or a SIM card and a micro SD card or two SIM cards. Now, I did some command line stuff with Android on this because that's the whole reason that I sort of wanted this is to be able to do some, some kind of advanced things with a physical mechanical keyboard. And it looked like it had an eSIM capability, but I could not activate it. I couldn't get that to work. So I'm, I'm not really sure that this actually has an eSIM capability uh, sort of built in. And there's a lot of things. Like if you go to the FX Tech homepage, it's like, oh, you can hit a keyboard shortcut, like something, something and launch YouTube. That's not actually true. The built-in launcher with Android, you can long press. And so like I can long press on C, for example, and launch Chrome, but that's just something built into Android 9. It comes with a pretty vanilla install of Android 9. It is a Qualcomm Snapdragon 835 with six gigabytes of memory and 128 gigabytes of internal storage. Of course, you can use the micro SD slot and add more to the internal storage if you're just gonna use it with the one SIM card. But like when I go to Computex to Taiwan, I can take my primary SIM card and you know take that out and then put in a, a Taiwanese SIM card and then be able to use this. And so for travel, and especially with the international plugs, this is gonna be kind of nice because the last time I went to Computex, I was using, I think, an LG G4. Now, it might bother some people that the processor in this is only a Qualcomm 835, but the reality is that's still a pretty snappy processor. Uh, it's about as fast as the Galaxy S8. So, eh, at least from fiddling around with it, because 
having a whole library of devices. Um, things that actually work pretty well on it, you know, like Steam Link. Steam Link worked surprisingly well. There are a lot of Android applications, however, that don't work that great in landscape or they'll force your phone to go into portrait mode. Fortunately, there's an app for that. It's called Rotation Control. So Rotation Control will allow you to set up Rotation Guard, which is an application will not forcibly be able to rotate itself contrary to the physical position of the phone. So as long as I have the keyboard open, the Android operating system is set up to have it in landscape mode. So if I try to launch an application that doesn't work in landscape mode, it will force it to be in landscape mode. And generally that works pretty well. Like most applications even that are like, no, you don't want to use this in, in landscape mode, it still actually work in landscape mode because the the screen is fairly high resolution. I think it's it's full 1080p, but I think it's actually a little bit wider than that because you can use two applications side by side pretty comfortably, although getting that set up and working was, was pretty fiddly. In terms of the physical construction, I've managed not to drop it, uh, but it is fairly solidly built. I have a little bit of trouble launching it. Like I can't, I can't open it with just one hand. I've got to, I've got to sort of do the two hand grab thing. And I think I would like to glue some, like a little rubber bumper or something on the top and bottom to make it a little easier to grab. But I noticed after using this for about a week that it really loosened up because when I first got it, it was like, it was holding on for dear life and it was just impossible to open it. And then after using it for about a week, it, it got a lot better. On the top edge here, we've got volume control power and a physical um, fingerprint reader. And then we've got a dedicated shutter button. So the shutter button will work even when the phone is locked. Well, it depends on how you have it configured, but the shutter button will work while the phone is locked, which is kind of a nice touch. The camera, it has a front and rear camera. The cameras are nothing to write home about. Um, the bundled camera application isn't great. Uh, I did sort of <clears throat> borrow the uh, camera application from the Pixel line of phones, and that works better. So. I think just the combination of like hardware and software and AI and you know, it's like, oh, this is supposed to be the, no, you can, you run a third party camera app and get a much better camera experience. So the camera is not completely trash. It's okay. So this is the front facing camera in portrait mode because I'm a terrible, terrible human being. Not great. This is the rear facing camera, the Snapdragon camera, as you can kind of see. And it's a lot better than the front facing camera, obviously. It's still not quite as good as modern feature phones or even, I mean, when I ordered this last year, it was like, oh yeah, A35, that's a pretty decent processor. And then, you know, here we are in almost March of 2020 and it's like, ooh. So why do you want an Android phone with a keyboard in 2020? Well, I remote into a lot of systems and I do a lot of, uh, a lot of like system administrator -y things and I can't really, you know, seem to get away from that. You never know when your computer janitorial duties are going to be required. So it is nice to be able to have a keyboard that you can, you know, run and a keyboard that doesn't take up valuable screen real estate, especially when you're using remote access software. I'm hoping that I can get Linux applications to run on this fairly natively. But the ergonomics of like the super wide keyboard do bother me a little bit. I mean, you in this form factor, you're pretty much doing all thumbs. Now, my pointer finger is long enough that I could enroll my, this finger in the fingerprint reader so that when I open it in clamshell mode, I can actually unlock it. Um, I find that if I'm holding it with my, you know, right, or I'm holding it with my left hand, then I have to use like my middle finger. And if I'm holding it with my, you know, right hand, it's a little awkward to get my thumb down there. I feel like I'm gonna sort of drop the phone. I think I would have rather had the, the fingerprint reader up near the top if it was if it was my choice because then that would work really well with either either you know either hand um, I find that I tend to hold the phone with my left hand and use my right hand which is a little off-putting for me because uh, I just I'm a weird person I guess um, and I would rather I would rather use it with the uh, the other hand but it's not nearly as awkward to use since this the spring has loosened up so I guess the short answer of why you want a phone with a keyboard in 2020 is I really like the T-Mobile Sidekick a lot. Uh, I think the ergonomics of that were pretty good. And so the thing with the T-Mobile Sidekick is that the speaker and stuff were on either side and the screen was quite a bit smaller. And they did make an Android version of it, but it was super anemic. It was way, way underpowered at the time. Microsoft bought it and killed the company, basically. And the guy that did the T-Mobile uh, the Sidekick, the Danger Hip Top, as it was originally called, uh, went on to found Android. So, 
uh, the ergonomics of like if you look at human ergonomics and like how people interact with the devices like early Android was actually probably a better user interface than modern Android things have gotten a little cluttered it's a little frustrating to use and if you look at the original um, danger hip top it did SMS and instant messaging there was a Facebook app there was a Twitter app I mean that's how old it is but it was fantastically ancient at this point uh, it worked really well for those tasks. It ran Java, but it ran Java well, kind of like Android, which maybe that's why, you know, Android. Um, the ergonomics of this keyboard are not as good. They're just, it's just not as good as a T-Mobile Sidekick. The benchmark for a, a keyboard that is this physically wide is probably on the HP 100LX. There has never been a, be and it doesn't look like it, but there has never been a better mobile keyboard that is this big these little sort of chiclet keys and the way that they click and just is this is an incredible incredible keyboard design uh, i feel like they probably could have gotten that in here certainly the sidekick not the last sidekick but probably like the third generation sidekick i think was probably third or fourth is probably the best keyboard i think that it would have been a lot better to have touch sensitive areas on the sides with a smaller keyboard in the middle from an ergonomic standpoint because mostly you're going to be using your thumbs on this you are not going to be touch typing on this even though it does have the little divots so you can you know find your 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 home row keys look my hands are the size of a small child this is not going to work for me in terms of being able to do this but after using it for a week i'm surprised at how quickly I can bang out messages on this, emails and stuff like that. It's definitely, for me, way faster than the touchscreen, the Android touchscreen. But it wasn't initially like that. The first few hours that I used this, it was, I was frustrated because it was like as if I could not type messages as quickly as I could on a touchscreen keyboard. But once I got used to the keyboard, I actually was pretty productive with it, which is, which is what I wanted. Um, it would be nice if the device were a little bit more powerful. So this might be my secondary phone or my travel phone. It's still not quite as magical as you know, the Sharp Zaris SLC 860. This is like a micro clamshell. I mean, look, look how cool that is. It's like, oh, I can do this. And then you open it up and you know, spin it around. It's like the old, it's like a, this is an import from Japan. This is, this is good stuff. It doesn't even have built-in Wi-Fi. You have to add the Wi-Fi through a compact flash card. That's how it's just, right on the precipice of technology. I think there are a couple other Android phones that have keyboards. I've also bought the Bluetooth slide out keyboard um, for like the Galaxy phones. And the build quality on this phone is fairly amazing. Uh, the back, it's got a metal back. Um, I don't know, I wish it were textured or something. It's a little smooth. I always feel like I'm gonna drop the phone. But the screen is, is top notch. It's uh, uh, AMOLED. I think it's AMOLED. It's uh, reasonably color calibrated out of the box. And in terms of like other features of the phone, it does actually have stereo speakers and a built in three and a half millimeter jack as well as an FM tuner. So if you plug in your three and a half millimeter headphones, you can use the FM tuner and that works well. It is surprisingly responsive for a Snapdragon 835, probably owing to the fact that it's got six gigs of RAM and my model has 128 gigs of internal storage. I think that's the only one you can get. So if you order this, it looks like you're gonna be waiting a fairly long time to get it. You can order it. Uh, I got mine, this is retail, I paid for it. I wanted it because Android phone with a keyboard. That's a, I'm a, uh, it's a little early for me to be having a midlife crisis, but uh, ordering an Android phone in 2020 with a keyboard feels a little bit like maybe, maybe there's some, some kind of a component like that to that, because once you get used to typing on a keyboard, you don't really need it. And I don't think that I could, you know, type on this keyboard blind, which is something that I really enjoyed doing on the T-Mobile Sidekick and the 100LX and the Sharp Zaris SLC 860 and the Motorola, there was like a clamshell Motorola pager. All of those devices, I got really good with the keyboard and I could, you know, type on it completely without looking at it. And that is not something you can do with a touch keyboard. I mean, I've tried, I'm not that good. So we'll see. Might do a follow-up review in three months and see how I'm, I'm doing with this. But this is the FX Tech Pro 1 or the QX1000, depending, I mean, internally it refers to itself as the QX1000. I hope this is not the last iteration of this product that we see from FX Tech. I think there's potential here. There are enough people ordering these that I think that they're going to make their uh, 
development investment back. They're a UK based company, but these are these are coming from China. And the whole like coronavirus thing. So the other big plus for this phone are operating system. So this is basically vanilla Android 9. I think this is gonna be updated faster than even like say the Galaxy phones because Samsung really lags behind on up updating Android in, in some cases. But you've also got the option of lineage and selfish. There are active development communities for both lineage and selfish, at least as of right now, February 2020, for this phone. So if you want to run an alternative operating system for this phone, that may be the happy medium versus you know, buying a, a $2,000 fully Libra phone and relatively pedestrian off the shelf technology. I could be wrong about that, but it'll be interesting to see where the independent developers take this thing. So overall, I think I was looking for the Android keyboard experience to improve the overall Android user experience. I really think that mobile computing, like mobile handheld computing on a phone, that experience really does leave a lot to be desired. It hasn't really improved much since the launch of the original iPhone. And that's sad. I think that there is a lot of opportunity for improved development um, of mobile computing devices, and it just hasn't happened. I'm not sure that a, a true physical keyboard is the answer um, in 2020. Maybe it's part of it, I don't know. But in terms of like usability and making a great device that people really enjoy using, that is easy to use and does what you need it to when you need it to, I don't know, it just feels like Android's getting farther away. It feels like Apple's iOS is also sort of getting farther away. Maybe on the iPad it's getting closer, but on phones, I don't know. Maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just getting curmudgeon -y, but there's, there's something that's not quite right there. I'm Wendell, this is level one. This has been a quick look at the Pro FX Tech, FX Tech Pro One. And uh, if you're watching this in the future or the far future, come to the forum at level one and ask me questions if you still have questions that I haven't covered. I'm Wendell, this is level one. I'm signing out and I'll see you later.